Um, I had prayed for about probably about three weeks on um, how the Lord wanted to minister and what was it that he wanted to be ministered from the pulpit near the time of Passover which begins Monday evening at 6 p.m. and goes till Tuesday night midnight and then you're in the seven day period of the Feast of Unleavened Bread but the Passover is like I said Monday evening to late Tuesday night we're not going to be doing anything here at the church on Passover but I encourage you guys to to um, however you want to do it but take don't let the day pass the actual day without honoring um, um, I'm sorry I forgot I just saw Charlene um, Charlene has an announcement so talk really loud Yeah. So that's a beautiful way to celebrate Passover, huh? And when it what day you said? On Monday for what time? About seven. Seven PM Monday. Over on the campus. Well there you go. That's awesome. That's one way to celebrate the passion of Christ by the group passion. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you were waving your hand back there because see, I forgot that quick. Um, but um, so anyway, I wanted to um, to deliver the message what the Lord wanted, you know, and if he wanted me to go back through all the steps of Passover again, whatever he wanted well for three weeks I was searching and searching and searching and it kept getting closer and closer and I'm like okay Lord I'm not hearing anything and um, so then um, I was going down this one particular path a couple nights ago and I was looking for a scripture which ended up taking me to Second Chronicles so when I read the scripture Another scripture catches my eyes. Don't you just love the way God does that? And it's like, just came off the page. Bam, there it was. My pen started smoking in my hand and just writing in notes after notes. And I'm like, okay, here we go, Lord. So, <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit different. Not what you guys are used to me doing when it comes to the, um, the holidays and the feast. But um, it's going to be taken from Second Chronicles chapter 34 um, <clears throat> I encourage you guys to um, to really dig through this this book second Chronicles I, I just man I was blown away by the detail it just amazed me um, anyway second Chronicles 34 and second Kings chapter 22 and 23 both speak of um, King Josiah and um, I'd be as bold to say as his ministry. <laughs> so um, King Josiah, I'm going to give you a rundown because this sermon is um, 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and carried over into 35 as well, the whole chapter. So I'm just going to sum it up um, for you guys. Tess, we recording now? Okay. Can I move? You can get me? Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so let me give you the summary. King Josiah, he was a righteous king, okay? His father and his grandfather, Manasseh and Ammon, were kings. Um, evil, pagan worshiping kings did not follow the ways of the Lord. Um, Ammon was um, <laughs> so evil that members of his own household assassinated and killed him after reigning only two years. Um, but Josiah was eight years old when he was anointed <clears throat> when he was anointed king and he reigned for a total of 31 years in the eighth year of his life now that puts him at 16 years old um, he really began to seek after God and 
he started to um, have this passion burn inside of him where he went and he cleansed the land of Judah and Jerusalem of all its high places, um, the ashram, the carved images, the molten images. And I want to stop right there for a minute. And um, if you have the King James Version, it says the groves. And that word really stuck out to me, so I went and I did some research and went back to the Hebrew and to the deep root meaning, you know, the root word and the meaning of it. And um, the grove was actually <coughs> was actually where they would um, go and cut off like a tree that's rooted in the ground, and they would go and they would cut off all the leaves and the boughs and the branches and they would carve the images out of the tree um, and, you know, set up altars and stuff like that. Not to mention that, you know, they also had like molten images, of course. We know they made of metal and silver. And, but groves there, when we think, or at least when I think in my mindset, I'm thinking a grove is something with maybe one particular type of tree, like maybe all almond trees or maybe all apple trees. I mean, I know they call that an orchard. But I mean, what I'm saying in my mind, a grove, that's what I'm thinking. And that's why it's the importance of studying the word and, and going back and, and looking at it looking at the, the Hebrew and uh, Greek meanings of things because then it opens it up, becomes a whole nother ball of wax, you know. Now you don't just see these wooden carved images set on a hillside. I mean, it's stuff that you still see today that they'll do that and carve things out. Um, you know, different witches and, you know, cults and the Celtic and, I mean, they do that stuff even today. All the way back here uh, in the Old Covenant, you're seeing that um, that's actually what the word grove there meant. And uh, also, I don't remember if it was in Second Chronicles 34 or if it was in Second Kings 22, but both of those talk about King Josiah. And in it, it even says um, Astaroth. Well, when you break that down, that goes back to Ishtar, the fertility goddess that is being honored right now. I'm sorry, but Easter has absolutely nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's pagan at its core. It's a fertility goddess. It's the sacrifice of their children and eggs dipped in the blood of those sacrificed children and laid at the feet of the altar of Ishtar, Astarat, Isis. She has many names. Queen of Heaven, which is in the Old Testament. Um, that has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And I just encourage you, you know, to really... Um, really, you know, maybe check ourselves and see is that something that we really want to instill in our children and our grandchildren because God says we're not supposed to do as the heathen do. We're supposed to follow his ways. Mm -hmm. And um, that has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with the Passover. Um, I'm not even going to go there. <clears throat> That's as far as I'm going to go, reining it back in. Um, so, uh, in 2 Chronicles 34, he's 16 years old, he's passionate, he's got this really intense relationship with the Lord, he's disgusted by what he sees in the land and beyond his kingdom of Judah, so he makes it his mission and his calling in life to go rid the land of all the, the altars. So he tore down the altars of Baal, he chopped down their incense altars, the ashrams, the carved and molten images. He ground them to powder and he scattered them on the graves of those who sacrificed to them. Then he burned the bones of the pagan priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. He was serious. He went, it even tells you when you read the whole chapter, it even tells you he went and dug up the bones of the priests that were doing these atrocities, whether it was at the Lord's temple or these pagan altars, and because he didn't even want the people of the land to go and try to start paying homage to the priest who sacrificed to these false deities. 
and he wanted to rid the land at its core, literally at its root. And um, so he went and he did this. He even went outside of his own kingdom of Judah. He went through the land of um, Ephraim, Simeon, Naphtali, and Manasseh. And I dare say, nobody stopped him. Um, so then he returns to Jerusalem. And the next thing where it picks up, it says in the 18th year of his reign. So now he's 26. He started this mission of purging and cleansing the land at age 16. Ten years he's going through this land and purging. Can you imagine the idol worship? The false deities, the pagan altars that's just covering this land? And I mean, this stuff is, is real. Here it is. We're right here at this time of, of Passover. And, and you're learning, you know, God showing us that King Josiah is dealing with the issue of what people are doing at this right now with the cute little Easter bunny candies and the Easter egg hunts. And all of it goes back to these images that Josiah was pulling down. Do you know Aserat was her, was um, worshipped and she was a Canaanite fertility goddess. I mean, that puts you right there in these biblical times, right there in the land, and tells you in Second Chronicles 34 that that was part of the, the um, altars that he was tearing down. We shouldn't be taking part in that, people, at all. Um, so it takes him 10 years, right, to purge the land. That is a serious amount of pagan worship going on in the land. So, in the 18th year of his reign, right, 10 years later, he had, when he had purged the land and the house, it says, King Josiah then began to um, rebuild and repair the temple. So, while they are cleaning out the temple, rebuild and repair and getting it in order, right, um, while they're doing this, Hilkiah, the high priest, ends up finding the book of the law of the Lord, is what it's called, that was given to Moses. So they find it, right? And so in the excitement, the high priest has his scribe begin to read it. And he's broken over it. In his excitement, he runs, I'm giving you the paraphrase version, he goes to King Josiah and he reads it to King Josiah. Josiah is beside himself and rents his clothes. And um, when Josiah heard the word of the book, it says, he tore his clothes. Then he gathered all the people and made a covenant with the Lord and had the people make a covenant with the Lord that they would follow the ways of the Lord and do everything that the book of the law of the Lord said to do. Um, then when you go into chapter 35, it says, Then Josiah celebrated the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. He set the priest in their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. Josiah had the Levites place the ark in the temple, told the priests to serve the Lord and the people and to serve them well. He divided the people in according to their households. And then it says, the king contributed to the people 30,000 Passover offerings, which means lambs and goats. 30,000. Then, now this is from his own personal possession, the word tells you. This isn't something he had to do. This was something, it was his, the word tells you it was his free will offering that he gave to the people. He also gave 3,000 bulls. Um, the king's officers, they also uh, wanted to be part, and they made free will offerings to the people. And these offerings were to the lay people, it says. It was given to the people so that the people, the king wanted to make sure what the word's trying to tell us. He wanted them to be able to have something to offer at the house of the Lord. This wasn't his personal offering to the Lord. This was... He wanted the people to be rooted and grounded in the ways of the Lord and to have something to bring before the Lord, to not um, 
feel distraught, to not feel like they didn't have anything to offer. He wanted to make sure everybody had something to offer. And so out of his own personal possessions, he gave 33,000 offerings in total. And then his officers joined in and they gave as well. They celebrated the Passover and the word tells us that they celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. Um, and then it ends with telling us that Josiah ends up dying at the hand of an Egyptian um, who was having an issue with someone else and he, the Egyptian tells Josiah, sends word, you know, what am I have to, to do with you? This has nothing to do with you and me. I'm paraphrasing, don't get involved. Josiah don't listen. Josiah ends up dying, getting slain at Megiddo and then brought back um, to his land and he ends up dying at the age of 39 years old. Um, Josiah's name means when you first look it up it says Josiah's name means Yah supports. But when you go and you dig deep what is the actual root word that his name comes from in the Strong's Hebrew? It means um, the Lord's, which Yah supports, right? But it means the Lord's foundation. And when you look up foundation in Hebrew, it means chief cornerstone, the rock. Sound familiar? So Josiah is a picture and a representation in the Old Covenant of Yeshua, of Jesus. Um, his whole foundation, the Lord's foundation, his name means Yah supports, the Lord's foundation. Um, it also, in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it talks about how Yeshua is our foundation. So it's clear as day that in the Old Covenant here, once again, another depiction of Jesus Christ in the Old Covenant. Um, and that he is our foundation. And Josiah, another... Um, representation that you know that Josiah represents Jesus Christ is how much did he offer? 33,000 offerings for Passover, right? 33. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the age of when Yeshua gave his greatest offering and hung on a cross for you and me. I mean, it's Jesus all up in, in Second Chronicles. I mean, it just blows my mind that here Josiah burns with this fervent passion to cleanse the land. Um, to, you know, and that, and that he gives a free will offering. It's exactly what Jesus Christ, Yeshua, did for you and me. Nobody forced him to the cross. The kids right now are in there learning that um, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus Christ to the cross. It was his love. And Josiah's love for God and his word burned within him so passionately that in the scriptures, in Second Chronicles and in Kings, it talks about and it says, never since the time of the judges was there a Passover celebrated in this manner, in this manner or since. That's in Second Kings 23, verse 22 through 25. It also says that there was never a king who turned his heart to the Lord with all his might, his heart, and his soul. Why do you think that is? God is so precise. Because King Josiah was a representation of Jesus Christ. So that passion and everything that burned in him was a representation of the foundation of the Lord, it tells you in 1 Corinthians 3.11 that it flat out says it. Jesus is our foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the rock upon which God built the church. Not Peter. Peter is not the rock. That's a, that's a misinterpretation of that scripture. Peter was not the rock that God was building the church on. God builds the church on no man. No man. That scripture has been so twisted and I've been so guilty in my own life until God showed me that revelation. 
You know, we are constantly daily needing to immerse ourselves in the Word so that God can show us the truth of His Word and strip away the teaching that we've been taught yep. and accepted as His Word, but never went and searched it out for ourselves, like our pastor always tells us. Yeah. He tells us that, one, because He's a good shepherd, <laughs> but the reason He says that is because we, in our life, have been su through such painful deprogramming. Yeah. Things that we thought, with everything in us, loving the Lord and thinking, is right, and not to say that the, the people that we heard it from, that there's something wrong with them. No, totally loving the Lord. But they were in the same position we were. They've probably been taught it too. Went in the Word. Just, oh, let me check it out. Read the Scripture, move on. That's not studying to show yourself approved. That's reading. Right. Reading and studying is completely different. Right. Completely different. And this is something that God has, has just been revealing to me personally and getting this house in order. Getting this land in order. Amen. And even though my husband is also my pastor... I do. My husband wishes that I would listen. Like I would listen. Like I listen to my pastor. I'm still working in that area. But my pastor tells us to go check it out for yourself. Don't take his word for it. And guess what? Just because he's also my husband doesn't mean I take his word for it. If anybody's going to challenge him or check things out, it's going to be me. And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I mean that out of love. Because if something's ministered and I hadn't been taught that way or I don't see it that way, I'm going to do what my pastor said and I'm going to go check it out. But he's also my husband. So I want to go check it out also and make sure that maybe he didn't miss it. Because his reputation's important to me. I don't, I don't mean that I know more than him. What I'm saying is I love the man. And I'm just concerned, and so I want to make sure. But first and foremost, the reason I check it out is because it's what my pastor tells me to do. Yeah. So studying and reading is completely different. And um, so when I started studying this stuff, and, <clears throat> you know, things that I just read over before never really stuck out to me, like Josiah giving the offering... I mean, it even just says it right there, a free will offering. I'm like, wow, how did I miss that before, that it was a free will offering, you know? But it's what Yeshua did for us as well. He gave his free will offering of his love and his life. It wasn't the nails that, that hung him on, kept him on that cross. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't um, Satan was victorious. No. This is all Jesus Christ, Yeshua's love that drove him to the cross for you and I. For people before us and people yet still to come. And I just find it amazing that it, it even takes the time in the scripture to say and point out that there had never been a Passover or a king like that since the time of the judges or till now. And I think the reason that little tidbit piece of information was there was because when you dig and you study and you find out that Josiah himself represented Jesus Christ. That's why he was a king like never before or since. Because there's no one like Jesus ever before or since or ever period. And so that's why um, those things are there in the Word for us to, to make us dig and to, to grab our attention and, hey, there's something more there and to study. I don't care what book you flip to between Genesis and Revelation, you will find Jesus Christ. He is in it all. And um, what I found interesting was when I did that, that study about... Um, Remember where I told you, where in the King James Version it says grove, and then did the study and found out what a grove was and stuff. Immediately, it made me think about, wow, God, it's so true that that stuff is still going on today in the world. You know, with physical places like that. I mean, I know everybody in here has probably heard about the Bohemian Grove. You know, it's the playground of the elite and the rich, and 
it's a place of pagan worship. The very thing that was going on then is still going on today. Now this is the sad part. It's going on in the church. And I'm not talking about oh the citadel. I'm talking about the body of Christ as a whole. And it should not be. Amen. It's got to stop. It's got to change. And it starts with me and you. Right. Searching ourselves with every believer taking the time and searching ourselves to find out what idols in our life what pagan worships going on in here and I really want you guys to think about this for, for a minute I'm gonna bring it back to the Passover but this was part of the study pagan worship what is at the heart of pagan worship okay first it's a false deity right that they're sacrificing to that they're lifting up and that they're elevating um, and what did they have to do in all pagan worship? They have to give offerings to their false deity. And they give the offerings to the false deity in order for them, their terminology is to appease the God. To turn away the wrath or to be accepted. Um, right? So Satan's the great imitator right so of course he wants to be praised and he wants to be worshipped and guess what anything that doesn't line up with this is not of God correct right. I mean either your father's God or your father's the devil right there's no in between so all of these false deities and, and pagan worship that's going on is um, you know I mean think about it I, I can't even imagine my own children or my grandchildren sacrificing them and whether it's um, they had uh, in Pergamon um, they would put them in this calf or bull and there'd be a big fire underneath and as this molten image would heat up the person they would put a person in the inside and they had holes in the horns and in the mouth the nostrils and it was a slow burning death. I'm not trying to be graphic. I'm just, it's a fact. And um, when the person would scream a slow death, literally being roasted to death, it sounded like the bull came alive. And they said, oh, that appeases the gods. That makes me in right standing. See, everything is self-centered and self-focused. Or they pass their children to... Um, through the fire with Molech. They'd offer their kids to Baal. I already told you what they did with Ishtar at Easter time. That should make you look at a dyed egg completely different. Never have want anything to do with that again. Ever. Do you realize they stopped doing this, I don't know, many, many years ago? They say they don't know why they do it. I'm, I'm not so sure I believe that. But that's beside the point. It's neither here nor there. But before the security had to be what it is today around the White House, do you know they used to take red, only red, dyed eggs and hide them out on the White House lawn and then bring certain organizations like of kids in to find the eggs? Only red. Why? There wasn't pink and blue eggs laying at Ishtar's feet, the fertility goddess. It was children's eggs dipped in the children's blood and they were all dyed red. It's pagan. It's pagan at its core and it all goes back to Egypt and Rome. Rome was the world power. I'm sorry, it's wrong. Even today in, in studying this and digging in in King Josiah's time and studying about, you know, the pagan worship, I'm going to tell you somewhere else, something we just came through that, that God showed me, you know, and it's not my intention, you know, on YouTube to offend anyone because 98% of my family's Roman Catholic, but I'm sorry. I, I can't have people's blood on my hands when I know the truth. Going through this study, God just, just showed me, um, woke me up. 3 o'clock in the morning a couple weeks ago 
and I heard three times, St. Joseph Altar, St. Joseph Altar, St. Joseph Altar. I was wide awake, sat straight up, turned the light on. I said, okay, Lord, what you want to show me? Um, I can't put it up here to show you. Usually that's all the stuff I just give to Carl, and he makes it happen. <laughs> we miss you, Carl. <laughs> um, but I went and I looked up did some research on St. Joseph altar and then took it to the word. The word says don't make any carved image. You're not supposed to elevate any carved image. You're not to make an image and pray to it anything in the earth or above. And I can say this because I was born and raised Catholic. I went to Catholic grammar school. I went to catechism. I went to Catholic high school. So I'm not someone on the outside, oh, you're picking on the Catholics. I was in it. And I didn't know I was in it. But this is my point, and the reason I have to go this way with the Catholicism is we don't realize a lot of stuff that happens today is because of the Roman Empire, their political system and their religious system was one, okay? Now even today, just about a week ago, UN leaders went to Rome to have an audience with the Pope so that he could address them on political matters. People, don't be deceived. He's not just an image of a priest. Rome is still a political power, if not the political power. It's no different from before. It's just whitewashed right now, okay? And there are numerous people of my own family that so love Jesus Christ, but are so steeped in the tradition of what they've been raised and taught that they feel like and don't want to break free from it. But I know God's going to remove the blinders one day and God's going to show them the truth. Because once you know the truth, the Word says the truth sets you free. And you don't want to have any part of what you know is contrary to God's Word. So as He started to show me this with the St. Joseph altar, I start looking through. I used to go to St. Joseph altars, get the cookies and the cross buns and the baked goods. And then God keeps bringing me to Scripture, bringing me to Scripture. Shouldn't do this. Don't do this. Don't. I mean, I don't even need to go into details. You guys know we're not supposed to be praying to any graven image. We're not supposed to be lifting up any graven image. Then people's argument would be, well, I'm not praying to that image. Well, you know what? The Lord says, don't even bow your knee to it. Come on. Yeah. The Lord corrected numerous people in the Bible when they wanted to bow down and worship angels who appeared. And they said, uh-uh. Paraphrasing. Only God. Only Jesus. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah. Right? So, if you're not supposed to do that, why would you why would you want to take why would you want to take part in it? And I know that what the scripture says about, you know, in one place you have don't eat anything sacrificed to idols, and then you other place in scripture, you know, basically if it's not conviction for you, you know, it's okay, but if it makes your brother stumble, then you don't want to do it. I'm gonna tell you right now. I will go buy my own Regina Biscotti cookies from Rouse's. I will not eat it from a St. Joseph altar. I would dare not touch it. But that's for me. Yeah. For him, maybe not. I don't know. But I do believe with everything in me that one day God is going to place me in a position to reach not only my family, but others who are in bondage to Catholicism. I have studied the catechism books, the code of canon law. This isn't just for me to study. God, he puts it in us to use it one day. And he does it with you guys. It may not be that. It may be something else. But each and every one of us, he wants us to live our life no matter what it is, according to the word, right? And that he doesn't want us to have part in pagan practices. He's purifying and purging and cleansing his church. 
not only because of Passover, but because he's coming soon. And he's purifying his bride. And when he showed me this stuff about the paganism, I'm like, still to this day, I haven't been serving in the Catholic Church since I was 19. I am 48. Until this day, he is still showing me stuff that I was in bondage to and I, and I didn't know it. But you know what? It makes me so grateful. It makes me so grateful. Like, first the shock value, like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't see it, you know? And then, so grateful that you loved me so much to reveal the truth and give me eyes to see. And so as I'm doing this study of the paganism, it brings me back to the St. Joseph altar. And so I did a study on it and then took it to the scripture. And, you know, it says too, this is, this is the biggest thing when they, when they do these altars. First and foremost, go on Google Images and just type in St. Joseph altar. You can have humble ones, you can have elaborate ones, okay? But something you'll notice in all of them, St. Joseph is elevated. Yeah. The cross buns, do a study on those. You know where that originates from? All the way back to the Old Covenant. Bacon cakes for the Queen of Heaven. Goes back to Tammuz. Goes back to paganism. Think about it. Rome was the political power. Right? Constantine compromised paganism with religion. And then you got the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not picking. This is fact. This is not me. This is according to God's word. This is not promises opinion. This is according to God's word. Everything can go back to Egyptian and Roman paganism. And the issue that that I have with this is and the importance of honoring Passover, the time that Christ chose to come and die for you and me and to be resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. And he tells us in his word that this is going to be a statute forever for all eternity that we're going to do. That means he places really high emphasis on his son laying down his life and that we should do it, not according to the religious motions and prayers and chants. And, no. Jesus has fulfilled it. But we're to take time and honor it. And not honor Easter because our opinion is, oh, I don't, but I don't do it for that reason. Because that was my... Don't do it for any reason. That, right. <laughs> right. But that was my opinion with Easter and Christmas. And, it, you know, well, and God corrected me. So, your opinion is elevated above my word? Talk about humble me and make me eat dust? When he said that, I was like, wow, I don't want to do anything. Am I perfect? Oh my God, I'm so far from it. It's not even funny. But I strive for that perfection. And that perfection is Jesus Christ and his ways. And so, if God reveals truth to us, in our hearts, we want to be so pleasing to Him that we need to strive towards that perfection and not take part in these things. And my biggest thing with God showing me this part in Josiah and altar and paganism and it led to the Canaanite fertility goddess and the cross buns and the baked goods and so it all led back. I'm like, God, now why? I know why you woke me up a couple of weeks back with the St. Joseph altar because it ties into this lesson today. And this is the issue. As a Catholic, we were told that you can pray to the saints and they'll make intercession for you. You can pray to Mary and she'll make intercession to you, to Jesus. That is demonic. I'm sorry. I can't candy coat it. It is flat out demonic. Why do I say it's demonic? Because it's contrary to God's word. Not my opinion. It's contrary to his word. There is one, one mediator between God and man. And it is Yeshua. 
It is not Mary. It is not Padre Pio. It is not St. Joseph. It's not Zeus. It's not the Easter Bunny. It is Jesus Christ and him alone. You do not pray to another man or person. I'm sorry. Wrong. The only way to the Father, the Word says, is through Jesus Christ. Right. He is the intercessor, making intercession for us daily before the throne. No one else. It's wrong. Don't touch it. Run from it. Don't partake from that altar. Why would you even? No thank you. Right. No, thank you. It stands for everything that is against God. It is not the Jesus Christ that you and I serve. It is pagan, and it is pagan at its core. And we need to now check ourselves. And this, this is what blew me away, how Josiah's life even ties in today to what they do in Israel and Jews everywhere. Josiah, you read the story, he's so passionate about cleansing the land. It takes him 10 years to cleanse the land, okay? Rip down the altars, digs up the false priest's bones, burns them on an altar, grinds them into a powder. He wants to stamp it out of existence. Why? Because he had a fervent love for God's word. And he wanted to be pleasing to the Lord. And the Lord was his foundation. The very meaning of his name. So ten years, right? He cleanses the land. My hair is standing up. Oh my God. I don't want to wipe my eyebrow off. Oh my God. He cleanses the land. And then the next thing you see in scripture, he celebrates the Passover. Oh my God. I'm taking your line. Ah, yeah! Oh my God! Oh my God! Do you know what they're doing right? Yes, I'm talking to you, not in vain. Oh my God! Do you realize? Oh! Do you realize that before Passover, they're going through their houses and they're going through the land and they're doing better cat hamets? They're taking a wooden spoon and a white feather and a candle and they're going through their house. They even make it a game now with their kids. And they purge their house of leaven. Leaven, oh my God, 10 days before. Oh my God, he cleansed the land for 10 years. Oh my God, oh my God, put that in my notes. Oh my God, put that in my notes. Wow, another morsel. So, better cat hermets, right? They got the wooden spoon, they got the white feather, they got a candle. They go through the house before Passover and they're searching for leaven because according to the law they have to remove all leaven out of their house. Leaven is represent represents sin, okay? And they've got to do this before Passover. And they take that feather and they take the light and the father of the house goes around with the light and when they spot the leaven he puts the, the candle down and then he takes the wooden spoon and with the feather brushes that piece of leaven onto that spoon and then they either put it in a bag or they wrap it in a white linen <laughs> so they, they and so Oh my God. Oh my God, they put 10 pieces out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the buttons are connecting. They put 10 pieces of leaven out because they do this as a tradition now. So not only are they literally like going in their cabinets, you know, and if they got bunny bread, it's got to go. They got to remove anything that's got leaven in their house because they still, you know, keep the law and stuff. But as a tradition, they go out and they lay 10 pieces of leaven. <laughs> yeah, bunny bread. Oh my God. Another nugget. <laughs> it's okay. God has made the bunny bread holy. <laughs> But, um, but, oh my God, I'm flashing. But 10 pieces of leaven that they go, and then they take it, 
they either put it in the bag and take it outside the city and discard it. Some of them burn it. Some of them throw it in a body of water, you know, meaning with the scriptures so that, you know, no man can go back and dig up your sin. And So they have different ways of doing it. But the point is, we know that Jesus is the light of the world, right? He died on the cross and through his sacrifice for us and us accepting him, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when we purge ourselves of the false idols and the altars that's in our life, then it's the light of, of the Word. It's the light and the illumination of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that helps brings it to the cross. When it's going on that spoon, it brings it to the cross and then it's gone. It's cast away. No more. And so, here King Josiah for 10 years cleansing the land and then goes and celebrates the Passover. Never been a Passover like that since. And it's a picture of what Israel does today. And it's what you and I need to do as believers. What altars are in our life? What idols are in our life that we need to bring to the Father, that we need to bring to the cross and have have it washed under the blood of Yeshua. The beauty of what Christ did for us is when you're still trying to live under law and not believing that the Messiah came, your sins are just covered for a year, right? According to the Old Covenant. But Jesus Christ came and He fulfilled it all from Genesis to Revelations. Our sins are not covered. Our sins are washed away. They're gone. That's right. And and during this time of Passover, you know, I, I want to encourage you guys. We have the Lord's Supper. I'm going to let Pastor come and, um, and do that however he wants to do it. But um, I just want to encourage you guys before we do this. And listen, we teach the kids about um, the Lord's Supper. If you're new here, then you probably haven't gotten it yet. But we don't discourage the kids from taking it. You want to take some time and explain to them because we want to train them the importance of it and what it means. And we want them to take part in what Christ did for them. Yeah. I just want to say, getting back to the word Easter, in our house, mm -hmm. we don't celebrate Easter. Mm -hmm. We call it Resurrection Sunday. Right. Even to the kids, they mm -hmm. call Resurrection Mm -hmm. Not Easter Sunday. Right, right. To get used to why we really celebrate, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right, Good. right. I understand. I understand that completely. Um, but even the, um, and it's good not to be Easter, but I mean, even like growing up, we always had, it was always Easter Sunday. But you see, when you go back in your history and you study, um, you know how the Jewish calendar works. And Passover doesn't always fall like that. Passover is when Passover, like Passover now is Monday to Tuesday. You know, so I'm glad you said that. However, it's a, it's an example, though, of how we were raised because of the Roman, because you were raised, you know, Catholic as well. And it's how we were raised. It, you just never questioned it that, you know, okay, Easter or whatever. It was always on a Sunday. But that's because that's what the church instituted. See, God wants you to honor the Passover when he died. Um, but don't get bogged down into, you know, um, they'll go and read the whole account of the Exodus and, uh, you know, that's not what I'm saying. It's that we have the revelation that Jesus Christ fulfilled it and that he was our Passover lamb, you know. Before we take the Lord's Supper, though, you know, I can't, I can't end without saying this, you know. Just ponder on when we read in, in the Gospels and Jesus goes into the garden and as he walks into the garden he hears his fellow Jews up on their rooftops singing Psalms 118 
which is called the Hallel. And it's all about they're crying out for their salvation to come. And he's walking down their cobblestone streets and they don't even know it. And he's heading to the garden. And when he goes to the garden to pray and to intercede, and he tells the Father, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. I want you guys to remember, he's not waxing poetic. He's talking about an actual cup. And it's a cup of the Passover Seder supper that they do called the cup of judgment. And no Jew partakes of this cup. They dip their finger in the cup and they call out the plagues that was in Egypt. Lice, locusts, you know, death of the firstborn. No Jew drinks of that cup. That's the cup that Jesus, Yeshua, was talking about. If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, thy will. You see, he was without sin. But I think something that we tend to forget is that he was a man that experienced the emotions that we experienced. And if you think that he was just giddy beside himself to go to the cross, no. He went to the cross out of obedience, sacrifice, and love for you and me. It was his love that drew him and it was his love that held him. But he was here as a man. He was there in the beginning in the Garden of Eden when the hide had to be ripped to clothe Adam and Eve. He saw it and he knew. He saw everything that was done when they were sacrificing before then. And he knew. He knew that his flesh would be torn. He knew the sacrifice and the price he was going to pay. So. I just don't want us to take it lightly to just know how much, man, God loves us. Yeshua loves us, and no matter what it is, your altar or your idol in your life, I don't care if it's, you know, um, cursing, you know, overeating, gluttony, drugs, um, whatever. I mean, not reading, you know, because your idol is uh, Facebook. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, I just had to purge myself that the TV and Facebook. You'll see me on there, but you won't see me on there all the time because it robs me of my time with the Lord. And anything that, it's nothing's wrong with Facebook and visiting with family that lives all across the country and friends. But do they come before your time with the Lord? Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, it did. And so, that was my idol and my altar that I had to, to tear down. So, just would like you guys to ponder on that and, sit, you know, however you want you and Jay want to do it. But I have the Lord's Supper up here. That's it. Amen. Jay, come on up and... Uh... That was good. Yes. That was a good word. Yes. Um, we'll get into it. Um, let me tell you a couple of things real quick. Make some connections with Josiah. Um, it means the Lord's foundation, right? He is a supporter of the Lord's foundation. He went forth to cleanse the land, just like Christ did. He cleansed our land. Ten years. Why was it ten? Ten is the number of the Word of God. It's the number of the law, the Ten Commandments. It represents the Word. Um, and she talked about the 10 years. They did it for 10 days, looking for 10 pieces in the house called Bedeket Hametz. Um, what they would do is um, uh, the father would take a lamp, right? And she had set a wooden spoon and a feather. Feather is in representation of the Holy Spirit. It was a dove's feather. They took a wooden spoon. Wood speaks of humanity. And they took a lamp. And the Bible says the Word of God is a lamp into our feet. And what they would do is they would close the doors and the windows. They would cut all the light off inside the house because the house represents you and me. We're the house of God. And with the lamp, the father would take his children through the house. 
with the lamp, which is the representation of the word. And when the father, he would go through the house and it was low to the ground um, and they would see it, the kids would say, there it is, right? And so the word identifies sin in our life. It's only by the word of God, right? And then when the father would see it, I like how he removes it. He don't say, you sinner, you're going to hell, you're going to burn. He takes that feather, which is the spirit, and sweeps it on that wooden spoon, humanity, which Christ bore for us, and casts it out of the house. It's called Bedeket Hametz. It's what, the, it's what the children of Israel do every year, and they don't even know what it represents. Um, but anyway, he died at 39. Josiah means foundation. He was a supporter of the foundation that cleansed the land. Right? You know, he started at eight years old when he became king. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Eight years later, God puts in his heart, you know, that he's going to uh, start cleansing the land. Eight, that's another eight years later. It's 16. That's the number of new beginnings again. Then, ten years later, when he's 26, 26 is actually the number of God. Yahweh. Yahweh in the Hebrew is the number 26. So he goes on this, it's God, he's, a, he's supporting God's work, going through the land, cleansing the land of all the sin that he sees. That's what Christ did. So he is a supporter of the foundation. Why did he die at 39? Well, number one, if you know the time, it was he died about four years before the destruction of the temple that started in 606. It was actually dest destroyed in 586 B.C., but, you know, uh, around um, 610 is, you know, he goes down into a valley and he dies at 39. Christ took 39 lashes, right? Any other man would have died. In fact, Rome perfected it. 39, one more death to the flesh. So, I mean, every little bit that's in there. What I want to do is, I want to just tell you something. They got all kind of ways that people, this is, uh, this is actually the, the, the holy place. This is considered the most holy place. Um, one thing about it is that God has called you to come in, right. right? And I know they pass the plate and you can go up and all of this kind of stuff. And, but you know, when you really look at it, you know, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. This is symbolic to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he's done. This is where you're supposed to check yourself yeah. to see if you're in the faith of not, or not, you know? So, you know, my brother's going to play. You know, we'll turn the lights out right here. Check yourself. Come up here with your family. Get it and partake yourself. Because, remember, God has called you into the holy place. Outside is the brazen altar and the labor that represents the cross where Christ died. Right? That's why it was brass. But you're supposed to come in to the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and a lampstand, the light of the Holy Spirit, shining, giving us the, the light and the illumination of who Christ is and what He actually did. You know, I can't, you know, you can't live off of, off of my bread. And I'm going to tell you another thing about the bread. The priests, when they worked in a holy place, they couldn't eat the bread outside. The only place you can eat the Word of God is you have to sit down face to face with Him in your Word. That's how you come into the holy place. Now I know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and you can hear it in your car and all these kind of things. But the man of the bread is the Word of God. And we're supposed to come into the holy place. Remember when John was caught up in Revelations into the holy place. He left the island of Patmos, right? This altar that he was in prison for because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's on an island, a rock island, an altar and waters around him. Wow, that's going to sound like an altar in labor, right? He's caught up into the holy place. And when John comes into the holy place, what does Jesus want to talk to him about? Hey man, I want you to send a letter to seven churches. Because there's some things that, that's in their life uh, that needs to be dealt with. And you'll find out when you come into the presence of God, this bread right here that you eat in this, this cup, really, you know, it's a representation of what Christ has done. It won't do anything for you. It, that is symbolic to the Word of God, which is the bread that you have to eat spiritually, the Word. That's what cleanses you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he's going to play, you know, and if you feel like God has called you, man, just come up here. 
and um, you know partake in the, uh, the bread and the cup and and um, it's good stuff let's pray Father Lord thank you for your word Lord Lord I thank you Father just to be able to uh, identify the times and the seasons that we're in Lord most of the world doesn't know Lord that right now that um, Father just in a couple of days from now you know Monday is actually the day, Father, that you, your son, rose, rode in to the city. You was bringing your lamb to your house so that they could um, check it out for four days before they killed it on the 14th. Christ rode in. Lord, we know what's going on, Father. You know, the, the Bible says that the enemy would seek to change the times and the seasons so that we would uh, not understand, Father, what it is that you're doing in this time, Lord. Right now, Father, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, you want us to just, uh, you want to cleanse our hearts, Lord. It's a time that we're to examine ourselves. Just like um, they would, Moses took the lamb in the house and they was to examine it for four days to see if they can find any imperfections in it and then bring it before the door. Lord, this is the time that we need to examine ourselves. Whether we're doing things that, 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 that we're not supposed to be doing. Father, cleanse this land. Baba, Lord, we're taken from the dust of the ground, Lord. Lord, cleanse our hearts, Father, and our minds and our body, Lord. Lord, so that we can be used by you, Lord, to bring others into your kingdom, Lord. So, Father, what we do today, Lord, we do in remembrance of what you've done for us, Lord. I thank you for your son. I thank you for, Lord, the, my wife had said that the cup that Christ partook of Lord, when he was sitting down with the disciples and he, he ate that Passover meal, it, the Passover hadn't happened yet. It was the meal before he was identifying who he was. And they all drank of that cup, that first cup that was in there. And then he went in the garden. And that cup, the second cup of Passover, Lord, is the cup of judgment, the cup of affliction. And he was afflicted for us. And he had said, Lord, if it's possible, Father, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, Lord, yours. Yeah. That cup of affliction, like my wife said, like Promise said, Christ knew where he was going for us. And man, he was sweating like, like unto great drops of blood because he knew what would happen to the lamb. He was grown up in Israel. He knew what it was to bring offerings to the temple. His family did it. He knew he, his flesh was about to be ripped off. But like the children learn today, it wasn't nails that held him. It was his love for us, Father. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. You guys come up and partake however you want.